Oh. Okay. We're gonna get we're gonna get started. Um, thank you all for coming to AIDS Institute Grand Rounds. Um, it's a tremendous um, kick in the head for me personally <laughs> um, to have our speaker here today, um, Paul Sachs, who's a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, clinical director of the Division of Infectious Disease at Brigham and Women's Hospital, and director of the HIV program there. Um, I met Paul um, in 1995 when a then little medical student tottered into Paul's office and said, I think I want to do internal medicine. I think I want to be just like you and do infectious diseases. <laughs> and I think Paul thought, oh good, one of them. Um, so I, I owe where I am today largely um, to Paul. Um, Paul began his education at the John L. Miller Great Neck North Senior High School. You might wonder why I'm telling you that. Me too. <laughs> Paul then went to Harvard College, um, where not only was he an outstanding academician, he also wrote for the Harvard Lampoon. You'll appreciate that in a little bit. He then went to Harvard Medical School, and um, then did his internal medicine training at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, one of the Harvard affiliated teaching hospitals. And when someone goes to Harvard undergraduate, Harvard medical school, and then a Harvard teaching hospital residency program, they are deemed preparation age. Um, so Paul then decided he was going to go into cardiology. No lie, he matched for cardiology fellowship. Luckily, he saw the light, decided not to do that, and instead went to the Mass General Hospital um, to study pus, um, and then came back to the Brigham and Women's Hospital where he has been on faculty ever since. Um, it, we are very grateful that he became particularly enamored with PUS and said goodbye to cardiology. Um, in addition to being an outstanding sought-after clinician and educator, Paul has published some of the most important clinical trials in HIV care and treatment in the modern era, including um, the uh, a seminal comparison of the new combination tablet Strybild to the um, standard of care treatment Atripla um, in one of its registrational trials. Um, important work um, on adherence to antiretroviral therapy and risk of hospitalization. Um, a, a definitive study showing the best nucleoside background for initial uh, uh, treatment of HIV infected patients through the AIDS clinical trials group. Um, uh, diagnostic work on the diagnosis of fungal infections, including PCP, um, and some important cost-effectiveness collaborations with the Harvard CPAC group. Um, but what does Paul do in his free time when he's not doing that? Um, he served for 10 years as the editor-in-chief of AIDS Clinical Care, um, or AIDS Journal Watch AIDS Clinical Care, or the New England Journal of Medicine AIDS Clinical Care. Um, but he's now given up that job to be the new editor-in-chief of OFID. What's OFID, you might ask? It's a brand new uh, open access journal by Oxford University Press, the publishers of clinical infectious disease and journal of infectious disease called Open Forum Infectious Diseases. So watch for that. And he also writes an incredibly amusing and entertaining blog called HIV and ID Observations. Please check it out and comment freely to <laughs> write back. He's also co-principal investigator at the New England AIDS Education and Training Center, principal and principal investigator at the Brigham and Women's Hospital AIDS Clinical Trials Unit, and a member of the CPAC research group. He likes the Yankees. <laughs> he likes the Yankees a lot. I don't know what he's going to have in his talk, but there's going to be a baseball reference. <laughs> I wonder what else he did, so I Googled him. Did you know that DJ Paul Sachs has done a remix of The Weather Girls, It's Raining Men, and he DJed at the ABBA Happy New Year 2014 party. I did not know that. I had to Google that. I didn't know that either. And did you know there was a such thing called Saxo Drive? Yes, I didn't either. Anyway, I just before I give the podium to Paul, um, I wanted to tell you the top 10 things that I have learned from Paul Sachs of you. Slides should always have a dark blue background with white writing and a yellow title. Aerial font. Thank you. <laughs> or, or the opposite. The opposite. Yeah, white, white, white and black and white is okay. I'm still a fellow. I can never. <laughs> never send emails in haste. The corollary to that is always know who's on the distribution list before you send it. The pharmaceutical industry and academics must have a tenuous detente. Always be honest, correct, and true. It is absolutely possible to be hilarious and brilliant at the same time. You're going to see that. 
The Yankees are awesome. Elvis Costello is pretty cool. <laughs> Having an encyclopedic command of the medical literature is a really cool party trick. Oh, Riding your bike to work is a therapeutic endeavor, <laughs> even in the Boston winter. Yeah. And super balls are really hazardous to your health. Yeah. Do not use them with yourself or your children. Okay. With that, <laughs> Paul Sachs. Thank you Thank for you. that. Rena, and I don't know how to get Paul's presentation back up. I think that's enough, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, that is the most remarkable introduction <laughs> I've ever heard. <laughs> and remarkable not in the true sense of the word, meaning not necessarily good, but that's OK. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm just going to, I chose this title based on the great work of John Bartlett, the former chief of ID at, at, at Hopkins. He, he would do things like this, and, and John, as you probably have heard, is, is retiring, uh, and he's moved, back, he moved to Mississippi. And so I, I asked his permission whether I could steal this title, and he said, he said yes. So that's, that's what we're going to talk about. So, but first, I just want to say that I am <laughs> delighted. <laughs> to be in Los Angeles. This is a, a picture from space, and it basically was taken sometime in the last couple of weeks, but it would, could be any day, uh, <laughs> essentially. And, and we have had an incredible winter, uh, and so coming here is really a pleasure. It's coming here not just because of my connections to Rafi, which are, which are very deep. And Rafi was really one of the best fellows we've had in our program. And notice I say one of the best, and now he's later going to say, you mean I wasn't the best? <laughs> and the reality is, he was the best. Okay, so, what, so really a, a great, great fellow. And we have a, a long connection, but Judy Currier and I also have a connection that goes way back. She was my intern when I was uh, a, a, a medical student uh, in, in 1985. Uh, at, at that time, actually, we saw one of the first patients ever to receive gancyclovir for CMV colitis uh, on our medical team. Uh, and then over the years, Judy has been enormously helpful to me during my professional development. She's a terrific mentor, even for people who aren't officially her mentees. So it is great to be here. And as Rafi also alluded to, we now share something in common in that we both have a dog. And you're allowed to put cute pictures of your dog on there, as long as the audience says, aw. <laughs> okay, there you go. That's, that's Louis. Okay. So uh, here are the rules. I'm going to talk about prevention because that's Rafi's focus, even though that's not my area of focus. And I'm just curious to hear what he thinks about the things I highlight over the past 12 months. But then I'm mostly going to talk about treatment. And it has to be sort of published or presented or released in the last 12 months. And it's got to influence uh, policy or treatment or something. You know, it's got to be influential. Um, no basic science in this talk. Sorry to disappoint you if you're expecting gels, but that, no gels. Uh, I don't think there's a single gel even close to this talk. And I apologize if I've omitted your favorites. I'm curious to hear what you think are, are things I've omitted for my own education. And also, uh, I have, I freely acknowledge I am being very biased towards my collaborators and co-investigators and colleagues. So I'm going to start with prevention, as I mentioned. And, and this is the first study. It's the study looking at pre-exposure prophylaxis, prophylaxis and injection drug users, a very controversial study. It was done in Thailand. And it was a randomization between tenofovir, not tenofovir FTC, versus placebo to prevent HIV in injection drug users in Thailand. And they also had an option of administering the therapy in a directly observed fashion. They enrolled over 2,000 patients. They were generally young men. And uh, most of them were not as high risk as we might think. Less than 10% of them injected daily, and only 18% of them shared needles. But it was a very ambitious study. And the study was completed. And here are the results. And, and uh, you'll see that there were 17 infections in the tenofovir group versus 33 in the placebo group. And, and you'll notice the figure has something very unusual about it, just to see whether you're, you're, you're paying attention. What, what's unusual about this figure? I can see that David is nodding right there in the middle. What, any, anybody see what's unusual here about the difference between, this is, I just tell you, this is the time over here, and this is the likelihood of getting infected along the vertical axis. Okay. I'm just going to be quiet now, and we'll have this pain <laughs> silence. 
<laughs> okay. Anyone? Well, there's no effect of three years. Yeah, three years. What's going on there? Exactly. Okay. You win a little prize. Uh, so, so, so why did I, I was very funny. I don't have any idea why that happened, but they didn't see anything for three years. Uh, it's very interesting to read the discussion in the paper where they, 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 they can't even speculate why this happened, but maybe Rafu knows because he's a prep expert. So the incidence was much lower than expected. Uh, they found, like in every prep study, that, that adherence made it more effective, surprise, surprise. All the factors that we know are associated with better adherence, at least in, you know, in many, many studies we're seeing here, in particular age, more nausea in the tenofovir group, no serious toxicity, and no incident resistance in those who got infected. So right as that paper came out, our lovely CDC uh, uh, issued their own guidance for pre-exposure prophylaxis. It's funny because one of our former fellows, John Brooks, works at the CDC, and I said to him one day, I said, John, what's the difference between a guidance and a guidelines, right? And he said, you would not believe how many meetings they've had about that. <laughs> Uh, but the bottom line is, there really is no difference. The guidance is kind of like a mini guideline. So that's, that's kind of uh, the, the bottom line. So they issued this guidance, and they said, you know, go ahead and use this for people who are at extremely high risk. And what do they mean by high risk? They mean sharing equipment or injecting daily or using cocaine or crystal meth by injection. Those are the highest risk people in the United States. Obviously, you have to exclude HIV infection first, like all PrEP uh, interventions. And they also, interestingly, took the leap and said, even though the study was using tenofovir, you should use tenofovir FTC. And the reason that was done was because that's FDA approved for use for pre-exposure prophylaxis already, and why not do that? So that, that was the guidance. So I have, have some questions, and I don't know the answers to these, but it's very interesting. Why was the incidence so low? There was this, oh, this effect that happens in any clinical research study. When you try to study something, then the outcome of interest always decreases. Uh, that certainly happened. What happened at year three? If anyone can speculate and have come up with a plausible explanation, I don't know. There was one of the letters to the editor said maybe the highest risk people dropped out of the study or something. Could, could that be? But then why would it not? I still don't understand. Did the CDC even need to issue this? And then I would say probably very important is in the parts of the world where injection drug use HIV is still a big problem, particularly in Eastern Europe, also in Vietnam, would this be a useful intervention? <coughs> in the United States, Rafi and I were just talking, incident HIV from injection drug users is really plummeting. It's actually been going down for years, and the people who study this, uh, uh, HIV and injection drug users, have been unable to get their grants, you know, and that's both the good news and the bad news thing. They're unable to get their grants because new infections are so rare, even in places that previously had terrible IDU epidemics, for example, Baltimore and, and parts of the New York metropolitan area. So, um, I'm going to shift now and talk a little bit about injection drug use. This is an amazing thing that's happened to New England since you've left, Judy and Rafi. Uh, New England has this new epidemic of injection drug use. It is, uh, it, we, we think the reason it happened was because there was this epidemic of prescription narcotic abuse. And then when prescription narcotic abuse got sort of the government said and, and FDA said, well, what's going on here? It made it much harder for those drugs to get out uh, to, for illicit use. And they were able to purchase heroin much more cheaply. So interestingly, this is about Maine. Uh, there was just one in the New York Times about Vermont. Uh, we're certainly seeing it at our hospital. We're seeing 18, 19 year olds with terrible, devastating uh, complications of injection drug use. Um, in particular endocarditis and hepatitis C, but not HIV. HIV is not occurring in this population, at least not yet. Another PrEP study that makes it to the top studies of the year, of course, is the VOICE study. The VOICE study basically was a very large multimodality intervention for prevention of HIV using both a systemic prevention, tenofovir, tenofovir FTC, as well as vaginal uh, prevention and multiple placebo arms. And, and this is a negative study that you can see the number of new infections is basically the same across there. And the thing that was so striking about the study when it was presented at CROI this year was that the adherence level was so poor. 30% um, of samples had tenofovir detected and about uh, half of them never had any tenofovir detected at all in the monks who were not here. It's really incredible and raised all kinds of questions about why were these people even in the study to begin with. Uh, I think that there are some theories 
and, and really raises, you know, we, we actually, we're doing a study now of, of uh, treatment of people with, um, who are elite controllers, giving them antiretroviral therapy to see whether giving them treatment can reduce some markers of immune activation in their residual reservoir. And, and why would someone want to be in that study? We had to be very careful not to end up basically bribe them with the incentives to be in the study. They have to understand that in study like this, you may or may not uh, get the benefit. Here, they were clearly thought they were getting some sort of benefit, but it wasn't the medicine. I think that's the bottom line. So then last uh, about PrEP is this, paper, this uh, article that just came out of the New York Times. Did you see this article, Rafi Landovitz? No? You've got to read the Times. Uh, so this basically described the fact that even though we know that pre-exposure prophylaxis is effective, in prevention of HIV among MSM, it's been very, very underutilized in the uh, MSM community in the United States. They had an estimate of something like a total of, I think, 1,500 prescriptions total since it was FDA approved. That's it. Uh, this, is, this particular man decided that he would say he's taking uh, Truvada for prevention. I thought it was very brave of him. Uh, and there are a bunch of reasons speculating why, uh, but, but I, I'm sort of curious, Rafi, if maybe you, could, you can give me your opinion when we have our discussion. Okay? Now, um, I couldn't do a prevention section without mentioning this one. Uh, I could probably just blank the screen out and say it didn't work. Uh, that's basically, uh, this is another gigantic vaccine study. Uh, this is the ad, you know, ad 5, the, the prime boost strategy, uh, just published in the New England Journal of Medicine, showing uh, it was really kind of a, 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 first of all, adenovirus is an amazingly cool looking virus, isn't it? It's like, boy, anyway. Um, that's why I went into ID, because uh, of things like that. But, but it was a, a randomized double-blind trial. It was, it was in high-risk MSM in the United States and transgendered uh, women. And they had to be seronegative for AD5, because remember, in the studies where people were seropositive for AD5, the AD5 intervention actually had a higher rate of infection, very, uh, very scary. And this is what they got. They got a multi-gene, multi-clade DNA prime recombinant adenotype five vector boost DNA slash add five. You don't have to remember that because it didn't work. Uh, but essentially, um, that's what they got at placebo. And they actually enrolled 2,500 patients. These are the characteristics. Primary endpoints were twofold. One, would they prevent HIV? Or two, if people got in HIV infection, would they actually have a lower viral set point? I've already given you the answer. The answer is no uh, to both of those questions. Those are the, the Kaplan-Meier estimates. You'll notice that the, actually the vaccine arm is a little bit higher uh, there, but it's not statistically significant. Vaccines, 28 cases, 28 new infections, placebo 21. No beneficial effect on vaccine on, on set point. They did detect immune responses. Um, but they had no correlation, at least none yet, with, with protection. Um, so a very disappointing study uh, overall. So um, I don't, I probably, everyone in the room knows this, that we've actually invested billions of dollars, nearly a billion annually in the HIV vaccine effort. I'm sure there are many vaccine researchers in this room, just as there are in, in my rooms. Uh, they, we've had six efficacy studies. One showed slight eff efficacy. Uh, one and possibly two showed increased infection risk, and three did nothing. And so uh, the question is open, you know, in the context of effective treatment and other prevention strategies, how important is continued high-level research funding? You could make the argument in both directions. You could say it's more important than ever because we still haven't figured this out, or you could say, well, you know, we're doing pretty well with the other aspects of it and other prevention, so let's uh, cut our losses. So uh, I am going to cite now uh, some of the work that I collaborate with, but I am not a co-author on this paper. Let me just highlight some of the stars in here. Uh, I work with this group, and actually uh, Judy worked with this group way, way back when. Wait, so I would say probably early to mid-90s, right? Yes. Sorry to give up your age a little bit. No, anyway, so this, this is basically the cost-effectiveness preventing, uh, cost-effectiveness group at, at Harvard. And this paper came out this year of prevention, uh, uh, cost-effectiveness of HIV treatment as prevention in serodiscordant couples. And Rochelle Walensky is the leader of this paper. She is extremely brilliant and, and extremely tall, uh, I should just say. Um, she's the kind of person who, when she walks in the room, everyone goes, oh, <laughs> wow, that's a tall, person. Uh, and then uh, Milt Weinstein. Milt Weinstein is a PhD. Um, he's a, one of these math people who 
you know, like when you're sitting there and people are just ruminating about some numerical aspect and then someone comes out with the exact number, um, it, it, it's, that's, it's very impressive. And he, he, can, he understands things extremely quickly. I would not play poker with him under any circumstances. <laughs> and then Ken Friedberg, who has led this group through all of these different activities, both national and international, like working with them has been a real privilege, but I was not, I want to emphasize, involved in this study. So basically, they looked you know, at cost effectiveness, which is this whole different way of looking at outcomes. It's basically, are you getting good value for your money spent? It does not mean that you save money. Hardly ever means that you save money. Very few interventions save money. One that does are certain childhood immunizations because you're preventing both the consequences of the infection, plus you're preventing a lifelong of, of disability potentially, and et cetera. But most things, you have to pay some money to get something back. And so the key metric is what are you getting back? And it's usually expressed as uh, you know, quality adjusted life years or, or life years saved or cases prevented, et cetera. So they uh, looked at this. Uh, and I, I, I really uh, kind of biased the people I highlighted in that author list. It was a very long author list. In fact, uh, Rochelle told me that the uh, New England Journal of Medicine told them too many authors, and then they had to try to get people to volunteer not to be authors. How do you think that went? <laughs> Nobody, nobody volunteered. Uh, so they went back to them and said, please. And so New England Journal Medicine, uh, they found other papers that New England Journal of Medicine had, which even had more authors. So that's how they got that many authors on. But anyway, I left off the people who were the parts of the HPTN 052 study team. And it was critical that they be collaborating because that was, they were able to use the data from the 052, which was treatment of early HIV infection for prevention, the, the Sentinel study that, that, uh, that Mike Cohn ran. Uh, they used those data to populate the model and makes the results much more robust. And they looked at clinical and transmission outcomes. And so this is a f one of the many figures in the paper. This is the early art here. And, and these are transmissions. So you can see this is a much better line than the other two. So, so no matter how you looked at it, treating serodiscordant couples in South Africa and in India was worth doing. In, in fact, for the first five years in South Africa, it actually saved money because you didn't have the expensive proposition of treating tuberculosis and treating other people who got HIV. And then over time, it just was very, very cost effective. Really couldn't make any changes in the assumptions to make this not cost effective. It was, uh, even, even in India, it was, it was very, very cost effective. So, so it really changed everything. And here's my first baseball reference, okay? Uh, um, so this saves money, okay? This saves money. And when Ken Friedberg presented these data at the Washington uh, International AIDS meeting, someone in the audience raised their hand and said, do you think these findings have policy implications? Said that to Ken. And I'll tell you, if you're a speaker and someone asks you a question like that, it is the equivalent of a fastball down the middle of a plate. You know, Ken, like, sort of, you, you, no matter what sports metaphor, it was an open goal or, you know, the free, free receiver downfield. He was so excited to, to, you know, to go and hit it out of the park. Of course it does. You know, people in South Africa who are paying for medical care should provide antiviral therapy to all people with serious screen couples. And Judy, what is this moment? Do you know that one? Carlton Fisk hitting his home run in 1975. Exactly. So anyway, that, that is, uh, uh, you know, the reason why I, I actually chose this is that the paper was, came out uh, just the night before the Red Sox won the World Series this year. So it was good timing for Red Sox fans and Ken Friedberg in particular. All right. So all this early treatment is really uh, kind of a, um, kind of a, um, a moot point because of this, this figure. Now, this is another paper. I, I, you know, some of the papers I'm going to highlight, some of them I'm just going to mention. I thought this was a fascinating paper that was in CID this year. It basically looks at the uh, CD4 cell count at presentation over time, looking at all these different studies. And the thing that I really liked about this study was it wasn't cherry picking. Uh, so it was a systematic review of studies that look at CD4 presentation. And you don't have to be a, a, you know, a mathematician to see that that's a very, very small upward slope. And then you could go to right, like, right here, 1996, when we began to have really effective therapy, and it's still, you don't see any inflection at all. And you know, we're getting better, but not, not very fast. It's really quite, quite remarkable. Anyway.
a little depressing. All right, last thing on prevention, then I'll move on to treatment. This is the uh, updated U.S. Public Health Service guidelines for management of post-exposure prophylaxis in the occupational setting. So uh, when it says updated, um, what do they mean? So here's the quiz. Prior to this version, when were these guidelines previously updated? Yeah, the answer, as Dr. Landovitz knows, is 2005. That's a pretty bad job in updating guidelines. Remember that between 2005 and 2013, when this came out, HIV drug development really accelerated, and we got drugs that are so much safer and easier to tolerate, so that everybody was kind of just sort of making up things to do, waiting for these guidelines to be updated. Finally, they were updated, and here's the key, uh, key aspects of it. First choice, tenofovir, FTC, raltegravir. I think that's a very good choice. Numerous alternatives are listed as well, which is also good. All of them, many of them very, would be very safe. No two drug options anymore. Um, no need to rule out window period and source patient unless clinically suspected, which is hardly ever. Glad that they explicitly said that. Makes management of occupational exposures much easier. Obviously, expert consultation for complex cases. And then I like this very much. Follow-up shortened to four months if you use a more sensitive HIV antibody antigen combo test. And if you look at the New York State guidelines, they say three months, three months. So what are you doing here at this? Hospital. I think they're still doing six. Six, six. So I'll tell you, I'll tell you, this, this is, anyone who manages post-exposure prophylaxis, this is really a nice way of uh, relieving people's anxiety to shorten the, the follow-up time necessary. And I, I hope that this becomes standard of care very soon. Okay, on to treatment. Uh, this is the, um, okay, take a deep breath, okay, we're going to go through a, a lot of studies. Um, this is a slide of historical interest, and it's because the last time you invited me here was 2009, and I dug through my old talks, and I found this slide, and it says in 2007, 95% of patients started either tenofovir FTC efavirenz or tenofovir FTC boosted atazanavir. 95%. Um, things have really changed. Let me just find out how many people are here are, are somehow involved with HIV treatment? Raise your hand if you are. Good. Excellent. So, so this, this is the way things were going then. It was kind of like this, this you know, Mike Sag described this as the gorilla, which was basically Tanaf, Rift, to see a and everyone was trying to beat it down. So this was an incredible year for integrase inhibitors. Uh, in particular, dolotegravir. Dolotegravir, four major phase three studies were presented or published, uh, three of them in treatment-naive patients. These are the three that were published, and, and a fourth one, Flamingo, wasn't published, so I'll just put a picture of a Flamingo there. Um, and then the other thing that happened is, you know, Tenofovir FTC, Alvitegravir Cobacistat, I, I confess that when the data first came out, we first looked at the data, there were these few cases of tubulopathy from tenofovir that were concerning to me and to many people and that fortunately have not turned out to be very common. That's, it's a very unusual circumstance. Uh, so, so both of those things, you know, I think really changed the integrase uh, as first option in, in many, many ways, but in particular the dolotegravir studies. So there are uh, all these dolotegravir studies. This slide summarizes the three treatment-naive studies, the SPRING-2 study versus raltegravir, the single study versus uh, a tripla. And here's a trivia question. Why is it called single? Uh, why is it called single? Single. You think, well, it's a tripla, so that's a single pill. But dolotegravir, bacavir lamivudine, was supposed to be a single pill, but they couldn't, couldn't make, it, make it in time, but it's going to be a single pill this year, so that's why it's called single. And then I have no idea why it's called flamingo. I, absolutely, so don't ask me. Uh, I, do, I do know that this is, this, is the, this is a very interesting study design because it has uh, three different drugs compared to three different drugs. I don't see that very often in HIV clinical trials. And then this last one is boosted darunavir. And we'll take a look at the results of these studies. But, you know, if you, if you wanted just to remember, dolutegravir always looks as good, if not better, than what it's compared to. It's really impressive. So first versus raltegravir, you see both at 48 weeks and at 96 weeks, it had, you know, dolutegravir, 88% versus 85, 81 versus 76, meets its non-inferiority th criteria. Um, and then in addition, it's just as well tolerated. Uh, finally, this last bullet point, no dolutegravir resistance. So people who fail this regimen, at least in treatment-naive studies, this study, uh, one of them, no resistance. 
no resistance detected. That's pretty amazing. Okay? Then this unusual study that I mentioned before, three different drugs versus three different drugs. This right here is of historic interest because for the very first time, there's a, a, a regimen that's beating an efavirenz-based regimen in a prospective randomized clinical trial. This is the first time that that's happened. Efavirenz, remember, approved in 1998, has been the gold standard for initial therapy. And you've got this, uh, this 88 versus 81 percent, which is significantly better. It was driven by discontinuations. There were 10 percent discontinuations in the efavirenz arm versus 2 percent in the dolutegravir arm. You could say, why 10 percent? Why 10%? I don't know why 10%. That's why they do clinical trials. It is a very high rate. It's much higher than in most studies. Um, and then in addition, this interesting observation that no one has been able to explain, that these efavirenz-based regimens frequently have less of a CD4 cell count response than the non-efavirenz regimens, in particular when combined with tenofovir. Why is that? I have no idea. Does anyone know? Uh, I, I sometimes think Cecilia Shakuma did a study looking at CRP in people who were in ACDG5095 and found that everyone in the efavirenz arm, their CRP was slightly higher than the other patients who didn't get efavirenz. I don't know why, because it, you know, it ended up, uh, but, but still, uh, it, it could be something inflammatory, but I, I'm really not sure what. And then again, no dolutegravir resistance. And then the third is the Flamingo study, and this is darunavir versus, darunavir tonavir versus dolutegravir, and again, you show superiority you know, 90% success with dolutegravir versus 83 for darunavir ritonavir. I mean, these are great results in all the treatment arms. And then, uh, you know, cut to the bottom right there, no dolutegravir resistance. So there are people who say, well, this phenomenon of no dolutegravir resistance is just a, a, the way that the, the study was done. They looked at patients who had very early virologic failure and they genotyped the first one. They didn't go and genotype the confirmatory one. Still, still, it's impressive. Uh, I think that even though that might explain some of this low incidence of resistance, and you could sort of intuit that because the incidence of resistance in the other arms was higher, but not that high, still, I think there is something about this drug that has a very high barrier to resistance. Lots of forest plots. The forest plots basically look at all of the integrase options. Raltegravir, Elvitegravir cobacistat, dolutegravir, and compares the low viral load stratum with the high viral load stratums, we have each of the major studies. And you know, to the right favors the integrase inhibitor, and you can see almost all the point estimates are to the right. So that means in the high viral load spectrum, as well as the lower viral load spectrum, you almost always see a beneficial effect of the, of the integrase inhibitor-based option. And the one that's most striking is this, uh, is this darunavir comparison here. And the reason I underline that is because a lot of clinicians think, oh, for my sickest patients, I need to use a boosted protease inhibitor. I don't think that's borne out by the data. We recently, unfortunately, had a man admitted to our hospital with pneumocystis pneumonia and had to decide what regimen to put him on while he was in the hospital, and we chose Truvada dolutegravir. I think that actually is, in some ways, our best regimen. So anyway, the guidelines decided uh, that we couldn't wait for you know, the next iteration, and so we've basically uh, convened a group once dolutegravir got approved, once we had more safety data on elvitegravir cobacistat, and we now list all four of the integrase options as preferred first-line regimens. All right, another slide of historical interest. So in 2009, uh, I was presenting this, uh, this slide about the importance of ACDG 5257, which is comparing a, uh, all non-efavirenz-based options for treatment, uh, adizanivir, boosted darunavir, raltegravir, all with tenofovir FTC. Uh, the co-chairs co are sitting in the front row here. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. One of the co-chairs. You, you two are, okay, anyway, okay. She's, they're, they're claiming they're not involved. You look at their pictures right there. They are very involved. And so since this study is uh, fully enrolled and completed, et cetera, we look forward to seeing results sometime soon. Okay, now uh, Rafi is presenting it at Croy. Excellent, Rafi is presenting it at Croy. Um, I am uh, going to say that Rafi has amazing quantitative skills himself. Uh, and his, his brother was a math major at Princeton, right? Yes? He dropped out. <laughs> <laughs> he was too smart. Okay, and you, and, and you, you, uh, you were in the MD-PhD program at Harvard Medical School, yes? I dropped out. Okay, so, 
So I am going to uh, show my great math skills by describing the asymptotic functions. And in case you want to know, this is a description of it over here. But really what I'm getting at is that we cannot improve HIV therapy virologically, at least if you're using plasma HIV RNA as your endpoint. There's no way. Uh, I, I, you know, the, these differences of 90 versus 83, or, or they're, they're basically these differences are, are, are driven by non-virologic endpoints. And that's, that's now a fact. And so novel treatments, if we're going to use them, they've got to give you something different. It's got to either be tolerability or safety or economic benefit, because the virus is not going to do it, unless you cure it, right? And that, I'll finish with that at the end. So the rest of the studies I'm going to talk about, if you think about them in this context, okay? So I'm just going to talk a little bit about tenofovir alafenamide um, because it is at least, you know, it, you could be cynical and say this tenofovir prodrug is like, is like an ambient CR. You know, it's just basically a way of extending the patent life of a drug that's very useful. Um, but it turns out it has some potential benefits. It's got much higher intracellular concentrations, much lower plasma exposures, and at least theoretically reduced renal and bone toxicity, definitely as lower a dose. Uh, and the phase three studies are now fully enrolled. This year, though, the phase two studies were presented both at Croy and at ICAC. I was able to present the data at ICAC. And essentially what I'm going to show you is that if you look at tenofovir alafenamide versus tenofovir desoproxyl fumarate and look at renal endpoints, you see a significant benefit, uh, interestingly. And then you also see a significant benefit when you look at markers of renal tubular dysfunction. I had to relearn a lot of nephrology. Um, these, you know, protein to creatinine and albumin to creatinine ratios are very crude markers of renal tubular function. Much more sensitive are retinal binding protein and beta-2 microglobulin to creatinine ratios. And here the TAF arm is significantly better in both arms. So it looks like in, even in phase two, much to my surprise, there was already a perceived, uh, a detected benefit of tenofovir alafenamide versus tenofovir. And then in the bone area, again, uh, again, much to my surprise, there was a significant benefit. This is DEXA scans in the spine and in the hip, and you had significantly less bone mineral BMD reduction in the people who got tenofovir alafenamide versus tenofovir uh, disoproxyl fumarate. It's interestingly, when you look at where abacavir lamivudine compares to this, it's actually somewhere in the middle between these two. So a little bit less of an effect on bone than abacavir lamivudine. And if you wanted to uh, impress your friends, you could actually t talk about the markers of bone turnover, but um, I always mispronounce them, so I'm going to skip it. But I just say that they do, they do in fact correlate with these DEXA results. So I'm going to throw it out there that theoretically our best future regimen is tenofovir uh, alafenamide, TAF, plus uh, emtricitabine plus dolutegravir as a single tablet regimen. And, and that's a picture of pigs flying uh, because it may never happen because they, these are, you know, this is capitalism. Um, it might happen. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, but in some ways you could easily see this being the best treatment we have and we hope someday to see it. Um, this study, very much under the radar, Gardell study, Gardell study. And I, I wanted to bring it to your attention because, you know, I get to use some business school cliches like paradigm ch shifter or, you know, you know some kind, something like that. This could be the beginning of something that's very different. It was presented by Pedro Kahn, who was the f uh, principal investigator at, at a European meeting. And essentially the principle is that we know that virologic suppression is not a challenge. Can we be do, do it with safer, less expensive options? Can we use fewer than two, three active drugs? Remember, thus far, the answer to this question always was no. Whenever they tried to use two active drugs, even two of our best drugs, like darunavir, ritonavir, plus raltegavir, it didn't work out so well. So this is kind of bold. You're checking whether to use two drugs, 3TC twice daily, plus lopinavir, ritonavir twice daily, versus three drugs where you basically use two nucleosides plus lopinavir ritonavir. So it's a very kind of bold study. Most of the patients were enrolled in Latin America. There was a couple of sites in the United States, I think in Texas, which is kind of Latin America, if you think about it, so <laughs> parts of it. All right, so anyway, the study, it's 400 patients, non-inferiority design, double therapy, twice daily, double therapy. This is three pills twice daily versus a standard lopinavir ritonavir based regimen. And, and the bottom line is it worked. It worked really well. It works so well that people don't believe the data. I'm serious. I've heard people say, this study can't be true. But 
why would it not be true? I think it's true. 88% success versus 83% success. It worked. It worked. Two drugs worked as well as three for the very first time in a fully powered comparative clinical trial. So, um, no decreased efficacy at high viral load. You might think that the patients with really high viral loads, that they wouldn't do as well with two drugs. But they did. They did fine. Uh, and they also had better tolerance because they didn't have that third drug, which was often, third drug was often zidovidine in this study. Zidovidine, we hardly ever use that in the United States. And the combination of zidovidine and lopinavir ritonavir, as anyone who manages pregnant women knows, bad combination, definitely. So, so that may partially explain that, the fact that, it, that, that, it did, that the three-drug three arm didn't do as well, but it wouldn't explain why the two-drug arm did so well. So I have uh, speculated why this worked, but raltegravir and maravaroc plus PI regimens haven't. Um, we uh, have never seen a fully powered HIV clinical trial that did not include lamivudine or emtricitabine. That is our, our, our best drug in some ways. Um, it's amazing. You know, lamivudine was approved in 1995, and yet it or uh, emtricitabine is still a major component. Would it work with once daily lamivudine or with adazanavir, ritonavir, or ritonavir? Who knows? Does it have implications for current therapy? I don't think anyone's eager to use twice daily lopinavir, ritonavir, and lamivudine. Of course not. But what about some other things? And then I think that the area where it probably has the best use would be in those patients you have on boosted PIs just because they had a lot of nucleoside resistance or something and they're smoldering along. And maybe we could manage them with two drugs, especially if they get some renal toxicity. Maybe. I don't know. All right, I have a question. You've been sitting there a while patiently. I want you to raise your hand. Uh, I have been asked at least once by a payer to split up a co-formulated HIV treatment. Raise your hand if this is true. N yeah, nobody, nobody, okay. So I will tell you that, that um, I have. Um, there, certain plans are doing this. In Maine, if you are in you know, sort of the equivalent of Medi-Cal, you can sign up for two different plans, and one of the plans will definitely ask you to split up your, your single pill. Uh, certainly in Florida it's happening, a lot of the southeast, so maybe not California yet, but I would be surprised if soon, come soon. And this is a, a, a cost-effectiveness analysis on generic HIV therapies that Rochelle, again, led. Uh, this one I was a part of. And basically, we compared tenofovir FTC efavirenz to the separate tenofovir 3TC efavirenz, assuming that lamivudine 3TC and efavirenz were generic. And so we could come down on the cost rather substantially, 15,000 to 9,000 a year. We had to assume that the generic approach was less effective. Now this actually uh, turned out to be controversial, turned out, but we had to assume it. The reason we had to assume it is because if we said it was the same efficacy, you don't need to do a study. You basically look at the cheaper one and go, that's better. Right? So, so we had to say it was less good. But we got all kinds of criticism from people who said, how dare you make the generic seem less effective? Well, you know, uh, there was just no way around it. Um, or otherwise, there is no study. So and anyway, it turns out, I'm going to explain this figure, that as you know, if you look at these individual lines, 25,000, 21,000, those are great numbers for cost-effectiveness ratios. Very Treating HIV is very cost effective. And the 25,000 is the, what you pay for quality of life year to give a tripla. And the 21,000 is what you pay for quality of life year to, to give the generic version here. And the reason why this study is important is because the incremental cost effectiveness ratio is over 100,000 for quality of life years. So this finding suggests that if we did switch people, either switch people who are suppressed to the generics, or if we started them on the generics, we could actually save a significant amount of money. Um, now, there is a trade-off. Remember, this is a slightly less effective regimen, but you could argue that there are so many other effective regimens to salvage this with that it doesn't matter. We tried to be as balanced as possible in the paper. Um, it got a whole lot of controversy, as you could imagine. Interestingly, most of it from people who were defending generic therapy, who didn't understand that we were saying the generic therapy was more cost-effective. So, over in Denmark, uh, they ran out of a tripla for a while, and so they had a national experiment. And, and they took uh, how many? Was it something like 500 patients in in Denmark? They had no a tripla, and they basically said you have to take tenofovir and lamivudine and efavirenz separately. And being good Danes, uh, <laughs> they did what they were told, and they maintained virologic suppression. I think 
it probably would work in real life too, not just in Denmark. Uh, and I do, I, I, you know, once people are selected for pill-taking behavior, they, they do a good job. Uh, so there are a lot of different ways to, to sort of mess with the regimen and it'll still probably work, including splitting up the pills. What I'm not sure about is those people starting out, you know, it's so nice to give them just one pill or at the most two pills, but we'll see. All right. So um, Wenslow Shearer came up with this idea uh, and I, I should have quote cited him. It's a, a randomized clinical trial that will never happen. So for the AC, future head of the ACDG sitting in the front row, I don't think we're ever going to do it. Uh, so treatment naive, any CD4 cell count, and you get randomized to a single branded treatment of choice or multiple pill generic treatments and the dollars that you save get given to the patient. Okay? And then the uh, study endpoints are virologic suppression, Adherence, healthcare utilization, patient satisfaction, overall costs. I think it's a great idea. Um, maybe one day. All right. So this is another uh, study that I chose to highlight that was done by one of my collaborators. In fact, Katie Mullen is a statistician at, formerly at Harvard, now is at UNC. And she came up with this idea. She was the statistician on ACDG 5202, which compared boosted as anivir to favarins. And she had noticed that as these sort of reports were coming in that there seemed to be quite a few people who had either suicidal ideation or something and said, why don't we look across other ACDG studies? So she came up with the idea uh, and she then enlisted some of the various people in these other studies <laughs> and we compared the time to suicidality in treatment naive patients who are randomly assigned to either efavirenz or non-efavirenz to get rid of some of the bias, selection bias that occurs in the community when we give efavirenz, where we don't give it to the people who are really bad efavirenz candidates. Um, and then we looked at the associations, et cetera. These are the studies that we included. That's a lot of data on a slide, but just to suffice to say that each one of these studies has an efavirenz arm and has non-efavirenz arms, okay? So that's, that's the key, the key principle. Um, some of them are crazy regimens in the old days, but like, like trisevere favorins, but still, still. Favorins versus non efavirenz that's the key and, uh, uh, intervention. And this is the primary endpoint. This is the Kaplan-Meier curve, time to suicidality, 47 in, in the efavirenz arm versus 15 in the non efavirenz arm, highly statistically significant. Uh, and uh, you know, we did it a different way. Uh, we did it both intention to treat and as treated, and we really couldn't, uh, couldn't, uh, couldn't get rid of it. Um, it did turn out that this was a relatively low risk. That's the top of the figure is 5% incidence, but still it's, it's real. Um, when you look at the uh, individual studies, you see that the point estimates line up all of roughly the same place, meaning that if you don't see it in one study, it's probably because the sample's too small, but then you put them all together and you might actually see something, which I think is what makes this such a nice study, and I think Katie did an amazing job with this. Um, things that would, would give you suicidality, they, they kind of fell out as you'd expect. You know, randomly assigned to a favorins, but then the others, younger age is always a risk, uh, injection drug use, psychiatric histories, et cetera. So that made sense too. And then there was a post, we, they, she asked a couple of us to adjudicate these endpoints. So we went through and looked at all these things and we noticed that in addition to suicidality, there were a whole lot of accidental deaths and things like that. So we said, well, why don't we look at those unexplained deaths and accidental deaths? So this is a post hoc analysis and there you see the same thing, that efavirenz patients, if you kind of lump them all together, suicide, accident, homicide, unknown, substance abuse, more in the efavirenz arm than in the comparator. And then if you look at other causes of death, you don't have to be a statistician to show that that doesn't show much of anything. So, you know, I fully acknowledge this is not a perfect uh, study because it's yeah, retrospective, but, but it has some certain strengths. I'm going to start with the strengths. We don't have the confounders. We have a large sample size. One of the studies is placebo-controlled and consistent results in all the studies. These are the limitations. Retrospective, we, un, we don't know whether people didn't disclose. Suicidality is very difficult to, culturally for some, some groups. Uh, some of the studies were open label and some of the regimens are old. But, but we did uh, ultimately conclude that you could calculate a number needed to harm for suicidality, 227 treated for one episode of suicidality. And uh, even though it was very uncommon, it's a serious adverse event, a very serious one. 
So I, ra I raise these questions. Should we prescribe it to patients with psychiatric histories? I think we're already not doing that. Um, should it be prescribed at all? Well, the WHO has basically said a favorin's for everyone. So this is a, these are extremely controversial data. Um, should we switch people who are depressed, who are taking efavirenz, to other things? I would certainly say, why not, since we have so many other options. And what impact will this have internationally? I don't know yet. So, last section. I have had completely stable patients with no side effects on antiretroviral therapy <coughs> ask about whether they should, could undergo a bone marrow transplant for HIV cure. How many people have had this happen? Okay. So, so what is wrong with them? Okay. <laughs> Ron? <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, this is the last section. It's a little bit about HIV cure, both the good news and some not so good news. Um, this baby got a whole lot of attention in Atlanta this past, this past uh, Croy, and boy, you know, not, nobody could talk about anything else for a little while. And it all rests on the fact that, that, that the baby did have an HIV RNA of about 20,000 uh, before starting treatment. Um, went on treatment for 18 months, then it was stopped, and then at follow-up at age 20, at 24 months and 26 months, they did find a little bit of virus at first, but then none, and they haven't found the HIV DNA and resting CD4 cells. I, you know, in the, the, uh, Dan Karitskis is my boss. Uh, you know, this whole like language of, of reservoir, these reservoirologists, they, this apparently is one of the most important findings right there. No HIV DNA and resting CD4 cells. But this is a really challenging area. And in fact, while I'm giving this talk, Dan is giving a talk on, that he calls needle in a haystack which is basically the science behind trying to find residual HIV in these patients who have such low levels of it, it is really going to be challenging. And to underline how challenging we know about these patients, these are two patients treated at the Brigham uh, and Dana-Farber, who did not get CCR5 deleted uh, donor cells, got regular uh, cells. They, they themselves were CCR5 heterozygous. And you can see that this is an amazing reduction in their HIV DNA. You know, that's exactly what I was just talking about. And they had this long period of time where they couldn't find virus using all the fancy methods that these labs have. Um, and then they reported this summer in, in Malaysia, I, I was not at the meeting, but I certainly heard about it, that seven weeks after stopping therapy, and 15 weeks after stopping therapy, these two patients still had not relapsed. What has just happened is that the virus has come back. Uh, two of these patients, both have rebounded, and they have resumed antiviral therapy and have achieved virologic suppression. And the full details of this, these cases are not yet in the public domain. So the cure agenda, which is a tremendously complicated and very, very interesting, um, is really still in its infancy. I don't say that because of the baby. It really is very, very early on. Okay. So um, who is this picture of? If anyone gets it, you're as much of a baseball nerd as I am. Okay, almost made it. The Hall of Fame votes were this week, and somebody missed by two votes. Uh, that's, that's Craig Biggio of the uh, Houston, Houston Astros. Houston. Anyway, so I almost included some of these other studies, but I was going to run out of time. The second line study, very important that, you know, most of these resource limited settings that recycling the nucleosides looks like it's just as good as uh, adding raltegravir or, to it, or raltegravir lopinavir. That dolotegravir was better than raltegravir in treatment experience patients. This one is one of my favorites. Uh, CD4 monitoring of little utility in stable patients. In fact, I would say it's of no utility. Uh, and we're really, it's amazing how we, we battle about this. Our, um, our Ryan White um, funders uh, who pay for our, our meds, our ADAP meds, they require a CD4 cell count every six months. And it's like, you got to be kidding me. I mean, they, they have to change that rule because it basically tells you nothing. Um, this, I almost included something on hepatitis C because it's obviously a huge deal, but it wasn't specifically in HIV patients. And this last one, a clinical trial that no one saw, unfortunate though it was, at IDSA, they, someone presented, uh, Lauren Miller here from Los Angeles, a, a clindamycin versus terethrin sulfur soft tissue infections. Certainly see a lot of those in ID, a lot of those in our HIV patients. Same outcome. Uh, so these were not for giant ones that needed systemic therapy, et cetera. So HIV, a very active area of clinical research. Prevention and treatment arenas are both amenable to significant progress. Even though we are very far along in treatment of this, it's not like we're done. 
And I want to <laughs> put in a recruitment pitch. We are actually now accepting papers. This is a, a peer-reviewed journal. It is an open access journal like PLOS One. Uh, it is going to be immediately uh, uh, not immediately, but as soon as we have enough papers, it's going to be indexable on PubMed. So it'll go right through PubMed Central. So please submit your papers to Open Forum Infectious Diseases. I did not make up the name. Uh, I think we'll get used to it in time. Uh, exactly. But, but, uh, and then last, uh, thank you, Rafi and Judy. One image for both of you. <laughs> uh, see if you can guess. This is, uh, that's Rent and that's the Red Sox. Can you guess which one's for which person? Okay. Anyway, thanks very much. <laughs>